There's a real problem going on in our world, and I don't know if you've noticed. It's been going on for a long time. It's in the news, um, it's out in our communities, in our workplaces, and in our churches. It's a problem that goes way back, started in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, and it is the problem of spiritual pride. We hear it everywhere, don't we? You hear it you know, when people are like, I, I don't want those people to come to my house, or um, those people, they go to the wrong church, or you know, are those people, you know, don't they know better? That's the problem with our world, it's those people. We hear these judgmental things all around us. And you know what's interesting? Spiritual pride is a problem with our vision, our perception. And so Jesus gets that, and so he said, do you see this woman? Because we don't always see other people as God sees them. But more importantly is we don't always see ourselves as we really are. And so how can we get to the point where we can see like Jesus? That's what we're talking about today. So let's begin with prayer. Lord, open our eyes to truly see as you see today. Reveal to us how we see ourselves, how we see others, how we see you, and transform our vision by your love. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. So we are finishing up a series on Christ Speaks to Modern Problems. And we have already talked about compulsive busyness, uh, misplaced priorities, uh, limited vision, misguided ambition and our next series called do unto others will even have christ speaking to us about a lot of things that divide us and how we respond to that um, but right now today we're going to talk about the problem of spiritual pride now what is pride i'm going to make sure i clarify this because pride is um can be good you know, when my grandson, uh, he got an award um, last Saturday, uh, he got an award for um, being best offensive on the flag football. I don't remember which part he did. But anyway, he got, I was so proud of him. Parents, we are proud when our kids do well and they've worked hard. You know, that's a positive kind of pride. But that's not the kind of pride we're talking about here. This is called spiritual pride, and it's spoken about a lot in the Bible. Okay, and so it is the kind of pride where you um, put your reputation, your thoughts, is everything's focused on you above God and the good of others. Sometimes we use the word arrogance or conceit or to have a puffed up view of oneself is better than others, more deserving of praise. It's the opposite of humility. Okay, humility, though, we get that wrong as well. We think humility means, oh, we must think we're horrible people. No. Humility means seeing yourself honestly as you really are. Who are you really before God? Okay, so it's not thinking better of yourself, and it's not thinking worse of yourself. It's just being honest about who you are. Romans 12, 3 says, don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself, measuring yourself by the faith God has given us. So spiritual pride leads us to measure our lives by the standard of our accomplishments rather than our God-given identity. Those who suffer from spiritual pride are often obsessed with comparing themselves with others, finding fault with others, making them seem where they're bad so that we feel, oh, we're good. And Jesus addresses this issue in the Sermon on the Mount. Why do, you see, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your eye? There's also a sense of entitlement, thinking we deserve better than we have. Okay, so when we, we deserve that love, that success, that comfort, that praise, and when life is hard and we don't get that, we complain. People that suffer from spiritual pride, they grumble and they complain. You know, I deserve better than that, okay? And in the story today, we see this kind of pride. So let's look a little deeper. First, there was the dinner party, okay? Um, it was by an important religious ruler, a Pharisee who invites Jesus, a popular rabbi, to his home. And according to the custom, again, the guests would have been greeted 
if they had been really you know, doing the right thing, they would have greeted them with a, a kiss. Uh, that was the custom. Or um, water, either with a servant to wash their feet, or um, they would provide water for your feet that were dirty from walking on the dusty road. Um, then they were often given oil, um, just to kind of you know a nice thing that a host does. And so that would be what you would do at a dinner party. Um, back then, they would often have a party like that in a courtyard. And there might be neighbors walking by and people walking by watching this. Um, they weren't invited, but they, you know, it was a very public kind of thing. And so when this woman appears, it's shocking to everyone. Okay, so let's talk about the woman. We don't know her name. The Bible says she was this woman who was in the um, city and, and, and she was a sinner. She had a reputation. Okay, it means that the people saw her as that. Um, some people want to label her as a prostitute, but we don't know that. But she was obviously had a bad reputation, probably very unreligious. And those in the city judged her and labeled her. The form used in this term sinner is past tense, Jesus used. Like she used to be a sinner. And when she enters this room with Jesus, she's no longer that great sinner. She has been forgiven. There's an assumption that she may have already had an encounter with Jesus before she came into that party. And so she's coming out of gratitude, coming out of just, um, just, you know, just love and gratitude that Jesus would forgive her. Think about that. It was a great risk for her to walk into that party, a woman into this group of men, and to, to just to pour out the perfume that probably cost a lot of money. So she sacrificed and Jesus does not condemn her. He uses her bold actions to teach a lesson, a lesson about spiritual pride. So then we have Simon. Simon's a Pharisee. He thought he knew, he could see clearly everything, uh, clearly the word of God and the people of God and all the things that he should know. Um, he, he wanted to see Jesus as a prophet, but he, wasn't, he didn't really see, he wasn't sure about that as well. And so, um, the, interesting that the woman is only focused on worshiping Jesus, but Simon's not. He's bothered by her worship. And so he's so bothered that he thinks it's inappropriate. Um, I once heard a worship leader, Joel Goddard, say, you can always tell who is offering acceptable worship to, your, to God because it ticks off and offends those who are not, who are not offering acceptable worship to God. And how is that? Well, here's Simon. He did everything right, right? He went to the synagogue. He did the temple. He did everything he was supposed to do. But his eyes were on the woman. When you worship, your eyes are on God. And if you're busy pointing out the faults of others, you're not focusing on God, right? Your, your heart's not in the right place. And so he's not focused. Jesus had dealt with Pharisees before, and that was part of the tension. That's not the first time Jesus uh, says something about their spiritual pride. In fact, in Matthew 21, he says, Truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. You see, the Pharisees were self-righteous people. Okay, and they treated each other with this, uh, people with a sense of, sim, su, su, sorry, I just got the tongue twisted there, su, superiority, there you go. And Simon's problem was not that he just couldn't see the woman, but he didn't see himself. He didn't see his own heart as he was. Simon says, I owe Jesus nothing, not even common courtesy offered guest, so he risks nothing. The woman said, I owe him everything, so she risked everything and responded with gratitude and hospitality. I wonder why. Was Simon worried what the others would think? Sometimes we do that. We worry what others will think of us. If we befriend that person that is kind of different from us, you know, when, um, it's easy when we walk into church to welcome the guest that's like us, same age, and looks like us. We go over and welcome them, but someone comes in looking different, not sure about them, we might stand back. We might not have that same hospitality. And so we need to think about that. Jesus looked at everyone the same. They were all loved. And that's how he greeted and welcomed everyone. 
I have been in some circles where women pastors were not welcome and accepted. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, most people would keep their distance, not be rude, but they wouldn't be welcoming, not even just say hi sometimes. Um, but I am blessed that every week on Wednesday, I join a group on Zoom of pastors from our community. And some of them are, are we think differently on different topics. We do church differently. But everybody there treats each other in kindness and respect. And I think that it is possible. It gives me hope for this world that we don't have to always agree, but we can treat each other with kindness, be humble, have hospitality for each other. I think that's so important. They, they don't act like they're better than me, you know, and, I, and I, I want to do the same for them. But there are the Simons, right? You know, we don't like those Simons. Actually, I'm always mad at God. I don't like those judgmental people. They are so mean. I don't want to be around them. I don't want anything to do with them. And then God says, look up. You're judging. Those people that are so judgmental are probably carrying a lot of pain, a lot of things, insecurity. They need your prayers. They need your love. They need your kindness. And you know what? It was a mind transformation for me that when I see someone that's being very hard and difficult, my first response now is to be quiet and pray for them. And then to be kind. And if it's too much, if they're just overwhelmingly mean, sometimes I have to take a step back, okay? You know, I, we disagree. I'm not going to fight with you, you know. I bless you, and I want you to have a good day. We just have to act in ways that represent Christ to this world. I don't know if Simon ever changed. He may not have. Um, I, I hope he did. I hope, because I believe that as we are kind and loving on other people, that it'll rub off. <laughs> it, will, it will help them. Uh, honestly, I really believe that. I've had situations in my life and my family where someone was mean, and when we responded with kindness, slowly that person changed. It's kind of hard. There's a verse that talks about heaping coals of kindness on your enemy's head. Um, but I do think that it happens a lot of times when someone is all emotional and angry and upset and we respond with peace and kindness. We don't have to agree totally at all, but we can still treat them well. I think that's important. Jesus saw people with compassion. Matthew 9, 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them. See, he saw them, and then he responded to help them. It even says in Matthew 14, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Jesus always acted on what he saw. He cared, but he believed that everybody had the potential to be transformed by faith in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit working in their lives to become um, a, a bearer of God's love. Jesus loves Simon so much that he tells him the story about the two debtors and the one that owed a lot and the one that owed a little. And he's like, you know, he wants him to get it. You have sinned too. You're no better than this woman. You both need God's grace. You both have been forgiven. Therefore, he said, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever's been forgiven little loves little. But she loved much. Simon didn't get who Jesus was. He was more than a prophet. He was God who forgives sins. We need God's perception to see other people as God sees them. Um, God is, not, is all about humility, not about spiritual pride. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. What does that look like in real life? Well, we have to stop practicing selective grace. I will be gracious and loving to you as long as you believe just like me and go to my church and do just what I do. That's not grace. That's selective grace. We need to stop. We can continue to treat people with God's love and kindness. Um, I love that um, author C.S. Lewis says, true humility is not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. I think it means also thinking about that other person and how they're feeling and what they're going through as well. Humility cares about others. The Bible says, Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Those that are spiritually prideful, they try to lift themselves up with all their accomplishments and things. But 
Christians, we should be letting God lift us up. And God gets the glory for what he does. Um, on the women's retreat, I have to tell you, it was really amazing. There were women that know me as pastor here, but there were also women that I, I am thinking one particular woman I've known since I was just a young mom. And I, was a, I worked in a preschool, and um, I just, her daughter was there, and she's like, well, how did you end up being a pastor? You know, and I was like, whoa, that was a journey. Because when I started off, I didn't say, God, you know, I'm so good, make me a pastor. It wasn't like that at all. <laughs> like, are you real? Really, God? Really? Um, but you know what? All I had to do was say yes, and God did that in me and helped me. God will help you. God will help you to be the person you're called to be. Whether that's ministering to your family, your workplace, wherever God calls you, God can work that in you. I also went to a church one time, and I won't say the name, but I asked a neighbor at a community event, what do you think about that church down there? And they said, oh, they're the big snotty church where people think they're better than others. Ouch. I don't want to be known as that here, and I don't think we are. I think we are known as the people that love and help and serve. And so I'm thinking about our VIM team and all kinds of ways in this congregation people reach out and try to welcome and love. That's the kind of church. Let's be known as the ones who love much. The ones who've been forgiven, but love much. I want us to truly be the disciples who make disciples who live and love like Jesus. Will you um, today open your heart to God to truly see as God sees and let him transform your seeing? Let us pray. Gracious God, I today, the question about am I good enough for you? God, we're all not good enough. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But God, we know that in Christ Jesus, as we put our faith in him, you through the Holy Spirit will work a miracle of transformation in our hearts. Help us to be new creations in Christ and help us to move forward and live in love like Jesus. We believe that. We believe that there's no sin that can't be forgiven. No one that's too far from God. And God, if some of us, if there's some of us who think we're too good, we don't need to be forgiven, well, God, help us not to miss out on loving much. Help us to see ourselves truly. And we thank you, God, for your love. In Jesus Christ, amen. If you can join me now.